All right, God bless. That's it for this Monday. Here is the hearing with Steve Horn over in the Capitol Live. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Government Management Information and Technology will come to order. Few things are as annoying as seeing a portion of one's hard-earned wages deducted from a paycheck for federal taxes. Most workers correctly assume the missing money is on its way to the United States Treasury. But today's hearing has been called because in too many cases and in too many of uh, hard-earned wages are not being forwarded to the Internal Revenue Service. As will be discussed by the General Accounting Office, the Congress's financial and program auditors, in releasing a report today, it indicates an appalling number of employers, as an estimated at 1.9 million of them, have deducted money from their employees' paychecks for programs such as Social Security and Medicare, then failed to forward the collected money to the federal government. The General Accounting Office estimates that $49 billion is at stake. Now, we're arguing over a piddling amount, saying we have a surplus. Obviously, we'd have a real surplus if we had the $49 billion there. The loser in this case is the United States Treasury, and of course that means every taxpayer. We will explore if the workers who thought they were contributing towards Social Security and Medicare won't be penalized for the loss. Often by the time the loss is finally discovered by the Internal Revenue Service, neither the business nor the delinquent employer can be located. In many instances, the culprits are businesses that were struggling to survive. To a lesser degree, some employers knowingly defraud the system. Either way, the Internal Revenue Service has failed to uphold its responsibility to the taxpayers. This is not an isolated problem at the agency. Reviews of Internal Revenue Service audits for the past two years have turned up significant weaknesses in the agency's financial procedures. Following each annual audit review conducted by the General Accounting Office, this subcommittee has held a series of hearings to examine the problems found within not only the Treasury, but in the 24 agencies of the executive branch that have most of the budget. On March 1, 1999, the subcommittee examined financial management at the Internal Revenue Service. The subcommittee found that serious problems existed with the agency's financial management systems, which cannot provide basic accounting information, let alone management information, in an efficient manner. In addition, the agency poorly controlled its records and the manner in which it handled its cash payments. Today we will focus on those employers who have failed to pay mandatory payroll contributions to the federal government. We are also concerned about those employers who have paid these taxes but whose record of payment may be buried in someone's file cabinet. We want to know the scope of this payroll tax debt, its causes, and what is being done by the Internal Revenue Service to prevent this massive violation of the law from recurring. We also want to know whether these delinquent employers are receiving other federal benefits, such as loans and other payments. We have excellent witnesses today who can answer these questions for us. Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, Charles Rosati, and Mr. Gregory Coots, the Associate Director of Government-Wide Accounting and Financial Management Issues for the General Accounting Office. Uh, we will start with the General Accounting Office. Mr. Coots will be accompanied by Ms. Cornelia Ashby and Steve Sebastian. And following that panel, Commissioner Rosati will be here and we'll introduce those with him at that time. So will the gentleman from the General Accounting Office uh, come forward and be sworn in, please? I think you know the routine. We swear in all witnesses. It's an investigating committee. And uh, your full statement is put in the record the uh, minute uh, uh, we call on you. And then we'd like you to summarize the statement. So if you'd raise your right hand, you swear the truth here and the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The clerk will note all three witnesses affirmed, and uh, I think we've got everybody there. Yeah, Mr. Turner uh, has an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the issue of unpaid federal payroll taxes is a very important one and has repercussions throughout the government. As a result of our failure to properly 
properly collect payroll taxes, the General Revenue Fund is forced to subsidize Social Security and the hospital insurance trust funds. Therefore, less funds are available to finance other federal programs when federal payroll taxes go unpaid. While the majority of businesses pay taxes withheld from employees' salaries, as well as the employers' matching amounts, a significant number of businesses apparently do not. According to IRS records, as of September 30, 1998, nearly 2 million businesses owed, as the chairman said, about $49 billion in payroll taxes, or about 22 percent of the IRS's $222 billion total outstanding balance of unpaid tax assessments. Additionally, $15 billion in trust fund recovery penalties has been assessed against and continue to be owed by approximately 185,000 individuals who are found to be willful and responsible for the non-payment of payroll taxes. Nonetheless, it is even more disturbing to learn that individuals and businesses responsible for the non-payment of payroll taxes continue to receive significant federal benefits and other federal payments, such as federal contracts or loans. The, GOA, the GAO estimates that about 16,700 businesses and individuals with unpaid payroll taxes and penalties received an estimated $7 billion in federal payments over a three-month period. Unpaid payroll taxes and penalties have a low recovery potential. We are gathered here today to learn about several factors that affect the ability of the IRS to enforce compliance and pursue collections in this area. These include system deficiencies and internal control issues which affect the integrity of IRS data, ineffective early warnings and taxpayer education programs, procedural limitations, federal and state laws, and staffing resources. Another issue affecting the IRS's ability to collect is their lack of capability to offset federal benefits and other federal payments against unpaid assessments. Federal law does not prevent businesses or individuals from receiving federal payments or loans when they are delinquent in paying federal taxes. The Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996, which Chairman Horn and this subcommittee steered through the Congress, called for the centralization and aggressive pursuit of delinquent federal receivables. However, they were unable to include federal tax receivables and other unpaid tax assessments from its provisions. I'm pleased to know that the Department of Treasury, using the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997 as its legal authority, is developing a mechanism which will grant the IRS the authority to place a continuous levy on delinquent taxpayer federal benefits to assist in recovering overdue taxes. Mr. Chairman, I hope we can get at the heart of the problem here today with this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Texas for that very thoughtful statement. Uh, the Vice Chairman, Ms. Biggert of Illinois, has an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for calling this timely hearing. I, th I think all of us here today want the same thing, and that is to ensure that America's entitlement programs, such as Medicare and Social Security, remain solid and dependable for this generation as well as the next. However, like many, I'm concerned about the health of these important programs as being undermined by a number of factors. Uh, today's hearing uh, focuses on another but lesser known factor that threatens to undermine the solvency of these programs, unpaid payroll taxes. And the General Accounting Office will present what can only be a disturbing report this morning uh, that details the extent to which payroll taxes are being withheld by employers but are not being re, uh, remitted to the federal government. Keep in mind, payroll taxes, such as the Federal Insurance Contribution Act, are used to fund and maintain the Social Security and Medicare trust, fund, Medicare trust funds. If what I understand the GAO will report this morning uh, is correct, that unpaid payroll taxes represent a substantial amount of the billions owed to the federal government in unpaid asse assessments. I further fear for the long-term health of these programs. Uh, today's hearing presents this committee with an opportunity to conduct its most important function, oversight. As such, I'll be interested to hear from the witnesses. Uh, I'm also uh, interested in hearing about what the Department of Treasury, which has jurisdiction over the Medicare and Social Security trust funds, is doing in this situation. Uh, 
Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this important hearing today. I look forward to working with you, the agencies here today, and the taxpayers to collect what is owed and to strengthen retirement security. I thank the gentlewoman, and uh, I see no other opening statements. So we'll go to the uh, General Accounting Office. The principal witness is Mr. Gregory Coots, the uh, Associate Director, uh, Government-Wide Accounting and Financial Management for the G Accounting and Information Management Division of the General Accounting Office, and he's accompanied by Cornelia Ashby, the Associate Director, Tax Policy and Administration Issues, and Mr. Steve Sebastian, the Assistant Director, Government-Wide Accounting and Financial Management. Please go ahead, Mr. Coots. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here this morning to discuss our report on unpaid payroll taxes. This report, which is being issued today, was prepared at the request of this subcommittee. With me this morning is Cornelia Ashby, an associate director in our tax policy area, and Steve Sebastian, an assistant director who works with me on IRS financial management issues. The bottom line of my testimony this morning is that delinquent payroll taxes are substantial, are largely uncollectible, and represent a significant enforcement challenge for the IRS. My testimony this morning will answer four overall questions. What are payroll taxes and trust fund recovery penalties? How significant are delinquent payroll taxes? To what extent are individuals and businesses responsible for these delinquent taxes receiving other federal payments? And what factors affect IRS's ability to enforce compliance or pursue collection in this area? First, what are payroll taxes and trust fund recovery penalties? Payroll taxes are comprised of individual income tax withholdings and employer and employee withholdings for Federal Insurance Contribution Act, or FICA, which includes Social Security and Medicare taxes. Employers are required to deposit payroll taxes every two weeks or monthly, depending on the size of their payroll. While the vast majority of businesses remit their payroll taxes as required, a significant number do not. Think of the federal government as a corporation and the businesses that pay payroll taxes as its customers. Inevitably, some of the corporation's customers pale, pay, fail due to factors such as poor management. As a result, for the federal government, Unpaid payroll taxes are like a corporation's uncollectible receivables. They represent a cost of doing business. One or more individuals found to be willful and responsible for unpaid payroll taxes can be assessed a trust fund recovery penalty. The most extreme case of willful and responsible we found was the diversion of unpaid payroll taxes to install an individual's swimming pool. This penalty covers only the portion of payroll taxes that are withheld from employees. The term trust fund recovery penalty is used because the employee withheld amount, amounts are deemed to be held in trust by the business on behalf of the federal government. The bar chart on the poster board provides an example. In this example, the corporation's unpaid payroll taxes are $75,000. The three responsible individuals were each assessed a $50,000 trust fund recovery penalty. As you can see, this penalty represents only amounts withheld from employees for federal income and FICA taxes. While each $50,000 trust fund recovery penalty appears as a separate assessment on IRS's records, the $75,000 of payroll taxes owed by the business are to be collected only once. I now move on to our findings, starting with the second question. How significant are delinquent payroll taxes? Cumulative unpaid payroll taxes at September 30, 1998 were about $49 billion and were owed by 1.8 million businesses. The components of this balance are old, with about 70% of the amounts predating 1994. The amounts comprising this balance are generally uncollectible. Our analysis of 191 unpaid payroll tax cases found that many of the businesses were defunct or otherwise unable to pay. Given the condition of these businesses 
it is not surprising to see, as shown on the pie chart, that we estimate only nine cents on the dollar will be collected for these cases. IRS records indicate that most of the businesses with delinquent payroll taxes are corporations. We found that they were typically small and closely held in labor-intensive industries with few assets available as collection sources for the IRS. We found that the most common types of businesses with unpaid payroll taxes were construction companies and restaurants. The cumulative balance of trust fund recovery penalties at September 30, 1998 was about $15 billion. IRS records indicate that these penalties were assessed against 185,000 individuals. Who are these individuals that are assessed trust fund recovery penalties? Typically, they are officers of the corporation, such as the president or the chief financial officer. Similar to payroll taxes, we found that trust fund recovery penalties are generally not collectible. As shown on the poster board, IRS records indicate that at September 30, 1998, nearly 25,000 individuals have been assessed trust fund recovery penalties for more than one business. In fact, as the chart shows, nearly 6,000 of what I will refer to as multiple offenders are responsible for unpaid payroll taxes at three or more businesses. Amazingly, the seven most flagrant multiple offenders were responsible for unpaid payroll taxes at 20 or more separate businesses. IRS revenue officers we interviewed believe that most multiple offenders are not flagrantly disregarding their responsibility. However, some revenue officers told us of multiple offenders who intentionally abused the system. For example, in one case, we found a president and owner responsible for unpaid payroll taxes at five separate construction-related businesses. Each company accumulated unpaid payroll taxes and then went out of business. Whether the individual exercises poor business judgment or is abusing the system, the failure to pay these taxes has the same effect on the federal government, increased collection cost and lost tax revenue. Let me now move on to the third question. Is it possible that businesses and individuals responsible for delinquent payroll taxes are also receiving federal benefits, contracts, and loans? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. As shown on the table, we found that over 18,000 of these individuals were receiving an estimated $212 million in annual civilian benefits. These include Social Security, civilian retirement, civilian salary, and railroad retirement payments. In addition, we found that 16,700 of these individuals and businesses received about $7 billion in civilian vendor payments over a three-month period. Also, we estimate that at September 30, 1998, about 12,700 taxpayers had received SBA loan disbursements of about $3.5 billion. Many of these individuals and businesses received these loan disbursements after defaulting on their payroll taxes. IRS revenue officers confirmed that individuals and businesses across the country responsible for delinquent payroll taxes were also receiving federal benefits, payments, and loans. The troubling situation I have described leads me to my final question. What factors affect IRS ability to enforce compliance or pursue collection in this area? In answering this question, I will touch on three key factors. First, systems deficiencies and internal control weaknesses make it difficult for IRS to manage its unpaid tax assessments. These system and control weaknesses have led to significant errors in taxpayer accounts. In our review of trust fund recovery penalty cases for fiscal years 1997 and 1998, we found error rates of over 50% in taxpayer accounts. In one case, we found that IRS had pursued and collected 
nearly $1 million of trust fund recovery penalty assessments from two officers and had placed federal tax liens on their personal property. However, these officers' liabilities had already been satisfied from bankruptcy proceedings relating to the business. Second, based on discussions with IRS revenue officers nationwide, we learned that taxpayer education and early, early, early warning programs are ineffective. For example, IRS's FTD alert program is intended to prevent potential delinquencies through early identification of missed payroll tax deposits. However, IRS field representatives noted that alerts typically are received too late to prevent employers from accumulating substantial tax delinquencies. In addition, these untimely alerts sometimes cause revenue officers to contact taxpayers who had already paid their taxes. Many revenue officers believe the key to improving IRS's effectiveness is to contact the business immediately after the first missed payment. Third, federal and state laws inhibit IRS's ability to enforce collection of payroll taxes. States govern the incorporation of businesses. If businesses fail to pay state taxes, state licensing authorities can deny them business licenses or license renewals. However, states do not consider federal payroll tax delinquencies in part because the Internal Revenue Code prohibits disclosure of federal tax information without taxpayer consent. Because the IRS is unable to share this information with the states to use in granting business licenses, stopping multiple offenders is clearly inhibited. In summary, unpaid payroll taxes cost the federal government billions of dollars annually. At the same time, businesses and individuals responsible for these unpaid taxes are benefiting from billions of dollars of federal payments. The end result is that compliant American taxpayers must pay more. For the federal government, unpaid payroll taxes are a cost of doing business. Based on the information I have provided to you this morning, I think you will agree that collecting payroll tax revenue while protecting taxpayer rights is a formidable challenge for the IRS. Some of the issues relating to enforcement and collection, such as incorporation at the state level, are beyond IRS's control. However, to improve the federal government's ability to, re to prevent default and collect these taxes, IRS must improve its systems, policies, and internal controls. IRS has concurred with the facts in our report and shares our concern. They are working on short-term measures to improve the accuracy of taxpayer accounts. However, we recognize that the system's problems resulting in errors in taxpayer accounts must be resolved as part of tax system modernization. Mr. Chairman, this ends my statement. My colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, we thank you very much for that helpful statement. Uh, we're going to have a round of questions, each of us five minutes. I'll start this one, and then Mr. Turner will be next, and then Ms. Biggert. Uh, let me just clarify a few things here. In, uh, you've noted the businesses and the ones that are very marginal, restaurants, small construction firms, so forth. Did you have a chance to look at the degree to which nonprofits, 501c3 tax-exempt ones, uh, did they default on some of these matches? Or we did didn't you have any, a sample like that? No, we didn't see that in our sample, but we did speak to IRS revenue officers who were responsible for that area and found that generally it's the same. It's very, very small not-for-profits that in some cases do not pay their payroll taxes, but it is not any large not-for-profits. Uh, do we have any idea how large that uh, universe is and where the default rate is? You're saying it's about the same? I don't know if it's the same. We would have to get back to you. We'll ask, ask the commissioner IRS. that. Uh, if the uh, taxes are not being deposited in the particular general account, as I understand it, it comes in with a coupon that's an excise tax, but it doesn't really tell which tax it is. It's just sort of lumped in. Is that right? Right. When the money comes in, it's generally not identified, although with their new electronic uh, tax payment system, some of the taxpayers are now identifying how much is collected for the various types of taxes. Uh, one of the problems with that is that IRS currently does not have the systems capability to summarize that data by tax type. 
but they are not requiring at this point taxpayers to send the information in with the money that tells where the taxes should go. Someone listening to this hearing is going to say, my heavens, do I have Social Security credits? Do I have Medicare credits? Uh, what could you tell them? I mean, do they still get their credits even if their employer's running off with the money? Yes, they do. Essentially what happens is there's a subsidy to the Social Security and Medicare trust funds to the extent that payroll taxes are not collected. So they, they do get made whole at the end of the day. And uh, you're sure of that? Yes. We'll ask the commissioner the same question. It's, it's basically coming out of the general revenue fund of the federal government. Uh, it, it's very clear from your data that uh, the Small Business Administration needs to get on board with us and perhaps have one of the loan uh, sheets before they grant any loans, have you paid all your taxes? And Mr. Then, Chairman, I would say that, that it isn't just SBA probably. That's the only pr loan program that we looked at. This would potentially apply to any other loan programs in the federal government. So Farmers Home Administration and all the rest of them? It could very well apply to those. Okay. They were beyond the scope of what we did at this review. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may add, uh, with regard to SBA, they do in fact ask pros prospective borrowers whether or not they have delinquent taxes. But apparently, because we did find several instances of SBA loans to such people, that that's not a deterrent from them getting the loans. Yeah, we've noticed that before. That's why we put the debt collection bill on the books. Some guy had taken three million at one part of the state from the same agency he'd taken it from several million from the other part of the state. But uh, there are a few rascals out there, let's face it. So uh, I'm going to yield the rest of my time to uh, Ms. Biggert, and then she can have her own time if I've got two minutes there, and then we'll call on Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you go over the, the early warning signs a little bit, or the early warning program a little bit? How, how long does uh, the non-payment go on before? Is there a shutdown? What happens? Uh, I'll, I'll give you an overall answer, and I'll let Mr. Sebastian maybe elaborate on that. Typically, it takes months, and sometimes it could take over a year before the actual FTD alert would get into the field officer's hands to go and, and knock on the taxpayer's door and, saying, and say to them, where are, my, where are the taxes, et cetera. So it takes a long time for the actual alert to get out into the field. Taxpayers file their tax returns, actually, uh, about a month and a half after the, each quarter, uh, but the alerts sometimes go out much later than that. And many times by the time the FTD alert would get into the field, the, the doors are shut, boarded, and, and it's all over. And then what is the recourse just to have the, the debt collection then to... Uh, the recourse is to determine if some of the officers were willful and responsible in that case, or there could still be bankruptcy possibilities where there's money that they could get out of bankruptcy proceedings. But the next course of events would be to determine whether anyone was willful and responsible for these withheld taxes and pursue the officers or whoever that might be. Would it be, did you have any knowledge of anyone then, let's say a construction company, it seems like they, do they change names and then start up another company? Yes, they do. They would change the name from, uh, let's use me as an example, Greg's Construction Company to Greg's Green Construction Company, something minor probably. Um, but it's pretty much in the same location in many instances. They maybe change the name on the lease, whatever the case may be, but it would be similar names so you're you said that probably the one thing that the states can't do or can't get the the federal tax records from these people when they incorporate a business or anything is there any way that with that incorporation and it could be knowledge that they had had where they had had uh, companies either in that state or in other states and what the financial outcome of that company was if IRS could share that information with the states, it could definitely be used in granting or renewing business licenses, but Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code does not allow for sharing unless the taxpayer consents. So right now that's not being done. Is there anything else, uh, laws that we have that, that, that cause us not to be able to find out or, or to collect the debts? Uh, for some, in some instances, state property tax, or not property tax, but state property disposition laws or ownership laws uh, and, uh, inhibit IRS from 
uh, perhaps collecting some amounts that they could otherwise. If, for example, a state has ownership by the entirety and you have a husband and wife but only one is delinquent on taxes, then IRS can't pursue that property because it's owned uh, jointly on that basis. Thank we'll you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. The next round. A uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner, five minutes for questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Ms. Ashby, you were talking a minute ago about the fact that SBA, before they disperse the proceeds of a loan, they do ask whether the borrower has, is current in their payroll taxes. But is it, is there some kind of certification or is it just merely asking across the table as you routinely go along, down the checklist of things at loan closing? It's one piece of information that's requested on the loan application. Uh, the prospective borrower is asked if they have delinquent taxes, and if so, on a separate uh, part of the form, they're to provide uh, information about who is owed, how much, the nature of the debt, and that sort of thing. So the problem is the question says, do you owe them or do you not? And if they say they don't owe them, then they go right on. That's right. Uh, couldn't the SBA require some kind of evidence to be produced by the borrower that the taxes are current? Couldn't you secure that kind of information? Couldn't the taxpayer either get it from the IRS or bring it in based on their payroll deposits and mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Th that's certainly possible. And in, as uh, Mr. Kuhn said, in terms of disclosing taxpayer information, any instance in which a taxpayer authorizes IRS to disclose the information, IRS can do so. So in, in, your, uh, in your question, the answer to your question, yes, the taxpayer could somehow provide certification that taxes are current. It would seem to me that if there is a remedy here, it may be one that could be implemented simply by SBA regulations. Uh, and I would welcome your assistance in coming up with a suggestion to the SBA that maybe Mr. Horn and I might consider sending to the SBA requesting that they modify the regulations because it does seem totally inexcusable for somebody to get a loan or disbursements under a loan when they owe payroll taxes. Uh, that ought to be paid first out of Gentlemen, the proceeds. Gentlemen, that's absolutely correct, and that will be done. We will jointly send them a little note. And if you'd help but us come up with what the right suggestion is, we would appreciate it. Please yeah. note, though, as Mr. Kuhn said, it's not just SBA. There are other government agencies, Department of Education with student loans, for example. There are other departments that issue loans, make grants, to the delinquent taxpayers. Well, we would welcome any suggestion uh, along that line because it seems to me that the agencies themselves would have the power to uh, remedy that through their regulatory authority. There, Mr. Uh, Turner, there is actually some guidance that was put out by the Office of Management and Budget in Circular A-129 that specifically covers uh, this particular circumstance uh, in looking through uh, loan applications making a determination as to whether the applicant is uh, delinquent on any, including federal tax debt. And if so, uh, the OMB circular uh, would indicate that you should deny the, um, the applicant the loan. It's kind of a There's good government type of circular, but it's not. It's a circular, and I don't think it has any legal necessarily binding. Well, it sounds like it requires you to ask, but not to ask for any underlying supporting evidence that you have in fact paid your payroll taxes and would indicate actually denying the uh, the applicant uh, if, if in fact it is disclosed that they have tax delinquencies and in an SBA loan situation uh, is it is it not um, fairly common that a disbursement might occur over a period of time under a loan or is most of the loan made all at once Ms. Ashby I would assume so, but I, I'm not that familiar with SBA loans, but th that would seem reasonable. Well, if you can help us with a suggestion to tighten up on that, it seemed like that could certainly be remedied. Uh, I noticed that um, in California they have the requirement uh, that a new business post a bond before they can be in business. Do you think uh, some bond requirement uh, would be appropriate to ensure the payment of payroll taxes? That is effective in the state of California, and that is one of the things that some of the IRS revenue officers we spoke to nationwide mentioned, particularly in that area of the country, as a potential uh, remedy to this. Is It isn't a remedy, but it certainly could uh, protect the federal government more than they are now. 
And what would be the, the pros and cons of a bond requirement for payroll, payment of payroll taxes? Well, the pros would be in the federal government's favor, and the cons would be that it would probably cost the business a little bit more to start up. They'd have to pay to post the bond, so there would be a little bit more cost, might be a little bit more time involved in starting up the business. I guess it would create a, an, an enforcement problem if we did not have the cooperation of the states to do it. I assume if we had cooperation from the states, uh, a corporate charter maybe would not issue until a bond was posted. But in the case of sole proprietorships, it might be hard to be sure we got the bond uh, at the outset of uh, the inception of the business. And uh, one thing I'd like to add, it's just a cautionary note, uh, when dealing with how to handle government contractors and so forth, there are extenuating circumstances sometimes, such as sole source for some critical service or good. Uh, so all of that needs to be taken into consideration in individual cases. It's hard to generalize and come up with one way of dealing with federal contractors. What's the main objection to uh, providing in the law that uh, civilian benefits and payments under contracts with the federal government uh, will not be made if there are delinquent payroll taxes. What's the downside? What's the objection? The, I'm sorry. Right. Well, I was going to say that the main problem now is the system deficiencies and internal control weaknesses in IRS's own records. Before one would do something like this, you want to make sure that tax is actually owed. And because of system deficiencies and because of timing differences between the time a debt actually occurs and when it becomes aware, when the revenue offices become aware of it to do something about it, the tax may have been paid. Right. You don't want to have someone having their Social Security paycheck garnished when, in fact, they don't owe taxes. And that possibility exists given the systems problems that we have at IRS today. And it's those sorts of considerations that IRS and the Federal Management Service are currently trying to resolve in order to have a system in place by uh, July of 2000. To, to actually levy such payments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Let me just ask a question or two to follow up on it. I think Mr. Turner has an excellent suggestion there. There is no law that says federal agencies can't share information. In fact, they can. Now, is the IRS compatible enough in its computerization of this that it would interface with, say, agricultural loan agencies, HUD loan ag agencies, SBA, and all the others? Is that possible? IRS can, in fact, share tax information for certain purposes under Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code. It can share such information with states and local governments as well, but only for certain specified purposes. And in, in terms but of... that's only limited to the states, not the federal agencies. Is that right? No. Uh, no. In fact, uh, IRS does share taxpayer information with several federal agencies, federal departments and uh, several states and local jurisdictions as well. But for specified purposes, such as uh, for the Department of Education to determine whether or not to make a student loan, uh, for local agencies to determine whether or not someone qualifies for welfare benefits, for example, that there are specified reasons that such information can be shared. And as of now, none of those reasons cover the, the instances we're talking about today. So there is no problem then on uh, interoperability or compatibility? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure there are some. I don't know how the exact nature or extent of them and what would it take to overcome them. I know I'm familiar somewhat with the Department of Education because I, I worked in that area in GAO. And there were systems problems that the Department of Education had to overcome to be able to accept the information from IRS and to use it in its systems. So I would imagine that's probably true for other agencies as well. When your team, Mr. Coots, uh, saw one person go in and out of business five times, uh, it's clearly playing games with the tax collector. Did anybody check to see what the United States attorney in that area was doing? And had the IRS put that file into the office there? Uh, that's a clear pattern in practice. 
as far as I'm concerned. Right. I, I don't recall, but the pattern is very clear. What you'll see is several quarters, let's say in 1994, where the taxpayer doesn't pay or the business doesn't pay, and then they appear to shut up the door or shut the doors, and then you'll see a year and a half or a half a year later, whatever the case may be, three or four more delinquencies for a separate company, and that ends, and then you'll start up another company. So the pattern was clear. I don't recall specifically whether or not that one was being pursued. Okay, Ms. Biggert, uh, five minutes for the Vice Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the federal government is really subsidizing uh, Social Security and Medicare uh, trust funds when these taxes have not been paid um, from the General Revenue Fund. Do you have any idea uh, if, how much of this is? Is this on an annual basis or accumulated it, basis? It is likely several billion dollars annually. We've done an estimate of the cumulative subsidy, including self-employed or SECA taxes, and at September 3098, we estimated that was about $38 billion, and that included accumulated interest over time. Now, that would be understated to the extent that taxpayers had rolled off of IRS's system. After 10 years, there's a collection statute where the taxpayers fall off of IRS's system. So anything that's not on the systems anymore would not be included in that $38 billion estimate. So on an annual basis, it's several billion, and cumulatively, it's been tens of billions. Is the IRS uh, in a position to be able to tell us how much is collected for their trust funds? Or is this re a report from you? They, they concurred with the $38 billion estimate cumulatively. They may have a better idea of how much is uh, the annual amount. Okay. Okay, then uh, I think there you mentioned in your written statement that um, states like Connecticut publish... Uh, the names of delinquent taxpayers uh, to increase the compliance uh, and generate co uh, collections. Could this be done for federal payroll taxes? Not right now with the Internal Revenue Code uh, restrictions. Uh, and I would again caution, as Ms. Ashby did a moment ago, on the data quality at IRS. Again, you don't want to be doing that unless you're certain that the taxpayers actually owe or that the amount is correct. And that it has just because of the timing was people pay and then it's you right by the time it's published they've already paid correct uh then you report that the irs and the department of treasury are not offsetting any uh, federal payments against unpaid payroll taxes does the current law authorize the federal government to to intercept or withhold federal uh, benefit payments to satisfy the delinquent payroll taxes Yes, it does. Under the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997, there is a continuous levy provision in there that allows IRS to levy up to 15 percent of those benefit payments to offset tax debt. Okay. And that is planned to be done maybe mid-next summer? Right. July 2000 okay. is the current So that plan. hasn't started yet? It has not started. It has right. not. Okay. It will uh, be rolled into the overall, under the Debt Collection Improvement Act, the overall offset program for the federal government. And then the Internal Revenue uh, Code authorizes the IRS to enter into an installment agreements with taxpayers uh, only if the agreements are, are for the, f the full amount of the liability. Uh, and you, the, you reported that uh, as part of the, its fiscal year 1998 financial audit that the IRS of uh, use of installment agreements does not comply with the IRS code. That's correct, uh, and I will give you an overall example, and then Mr. Sebastian has some examples from the trust fund recovery penalty work we did. But we found that over half of the cases we looked at, the IRS was in violation of that law. One of the ones we found as part of our 1998 audit was a $25 a month installment payment on a $16 million tax debt. And I have a couple, Mr. Sebastian has a, a couple more he can share with you on that that we found in this work. Yes, in uh, two cases where we had uh, unpaid payroll taxes, uh, one of the situations was a, a sole proprietorship and there was no trust fund recovery penalty assessed. The outstanding tax amount was about $220,000 uh, for the unpaid tax. The payments that were required under the installment agreement were essentially $25 a month, which would have yielded less than $2,000 prior to the expiration date of that particular uh, unpaid tax assessment. We had another uh, situation in which um, this was a corporation, 
two officers were assessed trust fund recovery penalty assessments. One officer entered into an installment agreement. Um, the total dollar amount of the uh, the trust fund recovery penalty assessment was about $3.3 million. And here again, uh, when you calculate out the monthly payments up to the point in time that that particular tax account falls off the IRS's records, the IRS would have collected $11,000. Now, when they've entered in, into that agreement then, does that mean that that agreement satisfies their, their payment? That's what the law requires, but what we're telling you is that that's not what's happening as of, again, our 1998 financial audit. What they're supposed to do when they're accepting less than 100 cents on the dollar, so to speak, is go through what's called the offer and compromise program, where they are able to accept less than a, once, 100 cents on the dollar. Uh, the issue with that is that there are more stringent procedures to review the taxpayer's records, and I suspect that's one of the reasons why maybe some of the uh, officers are circumventing that process to do an easier process, which you can enter into an installment agreement right now by telephone, is my understanding. So what you're saying is that they entered into that agreement and that has satisfied the IRS as far as the payment of those taxes? It satisfied the revenue officer that entered into the agreement, but it has not paid the full amount of the tax liability, uh -huh. yes. But is that tax liability still on the books then, or have they wiped out that debt owed? As Mr. Sebastian said, it, it would roll off of IRS's records after the 10-year statute of collections, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So it'll go away eventually. Uh, and let me add that uh, with respect to OMB Circular A129, if there's an installment agreement, then an, an agency contracts or issues a loan or grant to, to that uh, taxpayer, and that is in accordance with the OMB circular. If there is an active installment agreement and the taxpayer is making the installments. About how many of these agreements did you find then that were not in, correct in our, under the law? This finding actually came out of our work uh, on the fiscal year 1998 financial statements of the Internal Revenue Service. There were 93 cases out of a total sample size of 690 unpaid tax assessment cases. In 48 of the 93 cases where there were installment agreements, we found this situation where the uh, total amount to be collected under the installment agreement would not satisfy the outstanding tax debt. Were most of these companies that had gone out of business, or were the officers were paying this, or was this the company? Well, these, these 93 these cases companies. really across the spectrum, there are some businesses, there are also a number of individuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, this wasn't, this yeah, wasn't many specific of these were, to unpaid right. payroll taxes. Many of those were for delinquent 1040 or regular individual income taxes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I, I think we'll all have calls from our constituents when we get back to the office as to where do you get this million dollar loan and only pay $25 back. Did I hear that correctly? That's correct. And uh, this was on what kind of tax was this or was this a benefit out of a federal agency that wasn't the IRS? The ones that Mr. Sebastian mentioned were for trust fund recovery penalties, where there was $150 being paid a month on a $3 million balance. Uh, most of these were for individuals. That sounds like terrific terms. I mean, you know, were they serious? Or was We did not speak to the revenue officers. That's somebody's brother, you, Uncle Louie, or something. Okay, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner, five minutes. And let me be sure I understand. In these instances, Mr. Sebastian, these 48, the IRS had agreed to accept less than the amount owed, but they had not gone through the offer and the compromise program that would allow that. That's correct. Uh, and you mentioned that if this amount is not paid within 10 years, that it goes off the IRS's collectibles. Is that because there's a 10-year statute of limitation? That's correct. Uh, would it not be appropriate that if a taxpayer uh, is willing to enter into a, whether it's a, an offer and compromise or whether they just simply enter into an installment plan, that as a part of that agreement, the statute of limitation is told? You know, in, in the private sector, any time you acknowledge a debt, you pay on a debt, you extend the statute of limitation that otherwise would, would run against the collectability of that debt against the debtor. Yes, Mr. Turner, and, and, and in fact, that can occur as well. A taxpayer can waive that statutory expiration period. In these cases, they did not. 
Well, we, we have seen that before as part of our test work, though. It would seem to me that there, that there should be some requirement that if you're going to get the benefit of installment payout or if you're going to get the benefit of, a, of the offer and compromise program to reduce your tax liability, that automatically the statute of limitation is told against the debt that you're trying to pay. Would there be anything wrong with that being a part of the law? Not, not to my knowledge. I mean, is it statute that says that the taxpayer has the option to enter into an installment payout, but at the taxpayer's option they can say, if I can't make it in 10 years, you know, the debt's gone? Is that the taxpayer's option under law, or is that regulatory um, with the IRS? Under the specific provisions of the Internal Revenue Code covering installment agreements, that is, in essence, the situation, unless the taxpayer consents to tolling, as you, as you indicated, the, uh, the statutory collection period. So, in essence, the only leverage the IRS has is to, is to try to negotiate some kind of installment payout and also negotiate by trying to persuade the taxpayer to waive the 10-year statute of limitation. Is that section of the Internal Revenue Code is currently written? That's correct. I think we would strengthen the tax collector's hand if we just said in law that if you are going to take advantage of a payout agreement, an installment payout of your tax liability, or if you're going to take advantage of a compromise settlement, then you've got to be willing to waive the statute of limitation. Is that being too harsh? Am I thinking incorrectly here? Is there any downside to my suggestion? None that I can think of. Mr. Coons, am I, am I off base here? No, I, I think that's, that certainly is a possibility for improving the IRS's hand in this deal. And what's, what's, the, what's the taxpayer, um, you know, what's the defense the taxpayer would levy to argue against this suggestion? I mean, what, is this unduly harsh or they would just unreasonable? To, they would have to pay more at the end of the day. I mean, let me just say one thing on installment agreements. When we did report to you before that IRS was going to collect, I believe, $26 billion out of the whole $222 billion of unpaid taxes. Much of what we did see that was collectible was from installment agreements. So on the other side of the coin here, IRS has collected billions of dollars through these installment agreements. There are many installment agreements where the taxpayer is full paying the module. But again, as, as Mr. Spashin said, we did find about half of the installment agreements were being done inappropriately. Ms. Ashby, what would you say to my suggestion? I know of no reason why your suggestion would not uh, be appropriate. I was going to say that the issue here is the particular vehicle that IRS is choosing to use to collect from the taxpayer. Through the Office and Compromise Program, it would be perfectly acceptable for IRS to accept less than 100 percent of the debt, not so through the Installment Agreement Program. And apparently, that's in essence what is occurring. IRS can deny a request for an installment agreement. It can deny a request for offering compromise. And it can, as far as I know, stipulate certain requirements, such as a waiver of the statutory uh, statute of limitations. Well, it seems to me that the law should work for the IRS and the federal government just like it does, uh, I know at least in my state, and that is the statute of limitation doesn't start running until you have failed to make a payment. And any time you owe a debt and you continue to make a few payments along, the statute of limitation period runs from the date the last payment was made. And there's some valid reasons for having a statute of limitation, uh, but it just seems to me that if in the f case of the collection of federal taxes, the statute of limitation runs from the date, is this correct, Mr. Sebastian, the date of the inception of the obligation or the date of the original levy, that we lose an important tool that uh, every other private sector debt collector uh, understands and takes advantage of, and that is the statute does not run until someone has refused finally to make a payment. Yes. Yes. One of the statistics I might point out, um, we had apprised IRS of, of the noncompliance situation during the course of the, the 1998 audit. The IRS responded by issuing some guidelines uh, to, to its collection division and revenue officer staff um, 
that tightened up the standards through which the installment agreements would be entered into, i.e., calling for 100 percent payoff of the tax liability. Uh, if you take a look at some of the recent statistics that were published by the IRS, uh, they are showing a significant drop in the number of installment agreements through the first half of 1999 in comparison with the prior two years. So this, this may be a factor, the fact that they are going back now and tightening their policies with regard to when they would, would grant or enter, enter into an installment agreement. I have just one more question. Sure. Go ahead. If a taxpayer enters into a, an installment agreement or a compromise, which I think are valid tools, they're used in the private sector, they're important right. ways to try to collect a debt. But if they do that um, and then they fail to keep their agreement, does the IRS then? They have the ability to go back and pursue amount. the entire tax debt. That's All correct. Right. Well, I think if we can change the statute of limitation problem, we will would be making a significant improvement in our ability to collect our taxes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. Uh, let, let me ask you: When you went over these various collection horrors, did you look at uh, what IRS had done to recoup them, uh, and did they use it with their own revenue officers, or did they have private collectors? Did you ever try to see was there any efficiency and effectiveness in, say, private collectors versus revenue officers, or uh, revenue officers versus private collectors? Well, to the extent that uh, IRS has used private collectors, and, and to date that has been only in a pilot program, the collectors did not actually take the final actions to collect the tax. They simply uh, located the taxpayer and contacted the taxpayer initially. Uh, in the pilot, the one pilot that has occurred, uh, the results were not very successful, not very encouraging. Uh, it ended up costing IRS more to use the private debt collectors because of certain provisions in IRS's contract with the private collectors, uh, it what, cost IRS I, more than the collectors. E explain to me how. Well, for example, one of the provisions allowed a fixed fee to the collector for locating and contacting a taxpayer. It wasn't contingent upon collecting anything or it wasn't a percentage of amount collected. So because of the fixed nature of the fee, despite the re in spite of the result, uh, that in and of itself cost uh, IRS quite a bit. And in the case of the pilot, IRS had to take some of its collection employees. Yeah, but you said they're only going to get the person at a, at a certain address. I mean, I would have thought IRS would give them the address. Well, in, in lots of instances, IRS does not have a good I address. They, they may have an address, but have not been able to contact the taxpayer at that address. Well, then, isn't it make some sense if a private collector finds them and refers them to IRS? That's money they wouldn't have had. If they, in fact, collect, if they're able to collect based on that information. But it was, and you might, you might want to ask IRS about this later, but it was IRS's determination that it could not legally use private collection agencies beyond the point of locating and contacting the taxpayer. So any face-to-face -face meetings, any particular levying or anything else IRS had to do itself and had to take its collection employees to, to pursue those taxpayers. Uh, in the particular case of the pilot, there were a substantial number of delinquent taxpayers that were what IRS considers deferred. They owed a small amount of tax, and if with deferred delinquencies, IRS's practice is to collect that money through offsetting refunds. But in, this ca in these cases, a large percentage of those were part of the pilot. So well, these were the cases being pursued. Which pilot are you talking about? The one two years ago? That's right. Under the previous commissioner? That's right. That's yeah, right. well, that was as phony as they make them. They gave them five-year-old debt and expected them to come in with something. Right. And that's the only only action as, to date. There has okay, not been a well, subsequent pilot. We ought to be taking a look at that, but we can discuss it with the new commissioner. Uh, let me just ask two closing questions on my part. In your statement, you mentioned the extreme case of where the payroll tax money was diverted to an individual that used the money to build a swimming pool. Could you give us a little more detail on that case? And how many of those did you find? 
Yes, we can give you more detail on that. And I, I guess uh, the case is it's much worse than, than what I described. And Mr. Sebastian has the details on that, and he'll walk you through that briefly. Okay. It, it's quite interesting. Mr. Sebastian, it's all yours. Okay. Yes, this, uh, this business uh, actually was heavily involved in federal contracts, had contracts with the uh, Department of the Navy. Uh, as well as other federal That's entities. the swimming pool. They wanted to act exactly. Like the exactly. Uh, in fact, the, the business's revenues, about 65 to 85 percent of their revenues over a two-year period came from federal, federal contracts. Um, the business uh, withheld but did not pay uh, forward to the federal government payroll taxes in excess of, of $2 million. The IRS determined through interviews with the former controller as well as other third-party information that some of those funds were actually being diverted uh, to an affiliated company of one of the officers to purchase equipment, trucks, etc. The IRS also determined that other funds, other of the company's funds, were being used to uh, pay the estimated tax liabilities of one of the officers, to pay for the purchase or the installation and maintenance of a swimming pool, to pay off the, uh, the company president's wife's car loan, uh, to purchase a tractor for home use, and to pay for the maintenance this of is in uh, the a fleet of eight antique in cars. The farms. Excuse me? That was in the suburbs or the farm? I, I can't recall the exact location, okay. and I'm not sure what the, what the size of the tractor was. Uh, so it, it, there, there, were, there were more diverted payments beyond those for the, uh, the maintenance of the swimming pool. And again, the diversion occurred at the same time that these payroll taxes were being withheld and should have been remitted to the federal government. Yeah. Uh, what about some of the reasons that individuals continue to uh, have unpaid uh, payroll taxes at multiple businesses? Is it simply poor business management or intentional disregard for the individual's responsibility to forward the payroll taxes? What's your judgment on that? Are they just over the edge and they feel, gee, if I invest that money in my company, we'll make it? In most cases, I, I believe it's poor business judgment. Uh, the cash flow problems come up, and they're faced with the choice of paying the utility bill, the rent, or IRS. And I believe IRS falls to the bottom of the list. And I don't think that they really fully understand what they're doing. I mean, I would kind of look on, at this as a similar to a 401k plan, where you're withholding that money to send to the federal government, and you're not paying it. I don't believe everybody fully understands that that is that they're in kind of a trustee capacity here as an officer of a corporation. Ms. Biggert, any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think overall, our, our job and your job is to talk about the the collectability and the, and what happens to the taxpayer. I mean, we all end up having to pay for this. And it seems like we've got the, uh, the education program, and we've got uh, the alert program, and we've been talking about maybe the legislatively with the, the statute of limitations to toll that. I, I, don't, I think that's an issue we have to look at, because I think the installment program has brought in some money, and whether that will, will cut that off or not, I don't know. But I think the things that we can look at, what else can, can be, we can do, either as the Congress or we can, uh, you can do, or the IRS can do to, to make sure that we're not just being able to collect 9% of that, that debt that's owed, or even that there is the, so much debt that, that, that has been defaulted on the first place. Well, I would say, first of all, hearings such as this one where you are able to talk with the IRS about some of the systems problems they have and the control problems they have certainly uh, helps, and it, it helps them focus on some of the things that they need to do. One other possibility is with respect to the uh, offset program, potentially uh, while IRS is fixing its systems, setting up some sort of an independent audit process before the information uh, sent over to FMS is, is used for offset purposes to determine that the actual uh, data is correct. Because absent that, again, we, we do have some concerns about some of the offset going on here. And again, with respect to the sharing of information for the states, there's possibilities there with respect to changing the law, potentially. Uh, I, I, again, I think this oversight hearing is, is a good start. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen from Texas, have any more questions? Please feel free to ask them. Uh, just one. The uh, IRS 
as you've explained, is going to implement the continuous levy against uh, civilian benefits. And I believe Ms. Ashby said that that would be a, uh, an authority to levy 15 uh, percent. Up to 15 percent. Up to 15 percent. And I can see the, the wisdom in having some limitation on the amount that could be assessed to collect the delinquent tax against someone who's receiving some government benefit. How does that work with respect to vendors? Uh, that seems to be the largest category of, of delinquent tax amounts, seven billion dollars. These are people that do business with the federal government. Um, how's that program going to affect them? It will work the same way it will with respect to other federal beneficiaries. It's up to 15 percent of each payment can be levied, and I believe that's the intention. So if somebody has a contract to uh, provide um, paper to the federal government, there would be the authority to withhold 15 percent of the payment to that vendor and payment of the, the supply uh, of paper. That's correct. Pay against their taxes. That's correct. Certain programs are exempt from, from this also. Right. For example? Uh, Needs-based right. uh, payments, uh, such as... Um, unemployment. Un right. Uh, that's unemployment, right. Unemployment insurance payments. All right. It just seems to me that we... The rule ought to be a little tougher on a, a vendor who's supplying some product or service to the federal government than perhaps any other category that we've talked about. I believe or potentially you could consider uh, not letting them get federal contracts, too. I mean, that's another issue, mm -hmm. is should they have a federal contract in the first place? Is the IRS, in implementing this 15 percent, uh, are they bound by that by law? The 15 percent is statutory, right? Statutory. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. I agree with you. Maybe if we put out the word, we'll amend the procurement laws, and you've got to pay your taxes, suddenly billions might flow in. So we thank you for your testimony. Don't leave. We hope you can stay through the rest of the hearing, and uh, Commissioner Rosati and his team will be up. Uh, there might be some questions we want to ask you, so get a seat in the front row, if you would. And uh, now we are honored to have the uh, Commissioner. Accompanying uh, the commissioner is Mr. Paul Cosgrave, the chief information officer for the Internal Revenue Service, Mr. David Mader, chief management and finance, internal revenue, and Mr. Charles Peterson, the assistant commissioner. And uh, if you're all going to testify and anybody behind you that's going to testify or have a loud whisper, just uh, have them stand up and raise their hand. I, I only want one baptism at a time. Uh, you solemnly swear a testimony you will give before the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note all four witnesses affirmed, and uh, we're delighted to have you, Commissioner. And uh, please render your statement however you'd like to Thank do you. it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Okay. Chairman, I'm glad, glad to be here. Uh, I think the GAO has provided a very thoughtful examination of IRS uh, deficiencies with respect to collection of payroll taxes and trust fund recovery program. Uh, we agree with the finding that most of these payroll taxes on the IRS books at the present time are not fully collectible. Uh, but more importantly, I think GAO has identified, as they have in the past, some, some long-standing management systems deficiencies that uh, have prevented us from collecting or solving many of these problems. And I think uh, these same shortcomings tend to be the root cause of many of the problems described in this report as well as other reports. And, Mr. Chairman, as we have discussed on a number of occasions, uh, our decades-old technology is really a key factor, a stumbling block, if you will, in our ability to provide adequate service and efficient tax administration, including, in particular, early collection and intervention on payroll tax issues. We need to recall that the basic data systems that the IRS uses to keep records on all taxpayers' tax accounts, including payroll taxes, 
uh, are built on about a 30-year-old uh, set of systems, which is a fundamentally deficient foundation for tax administration. And GAO has repeatedly reported and continues to report, as they did this morning, that the IRS cannot provide reliable taxpayer account and financial information uh, for, for many purposes, uh, including the ones that are discussed here today. In the opinion on the uh, audited custodial financial statements, GAO cited as a material weakness the lack of a system to be able to routinely generate reliable and uh, timely financial information for internal and external users. And in particular, GAO noted the lack of subsidiary ledgers that track and accumulate unpaid assessments on an ongoing basis. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, we simply cannot do our job properly in many dimensions without this data and in particular, updating our business practices to both serve taxpayers better and also to be more efficient in collecting taxes uh, really depends on our ability to update these computer applications and to convert all the existing taxpayer data. Now, this, as we've noted, is a very vast and complex and, frankly, risky undertaking that's going to take a number of years to accomplish. However, we think an important initial step was taken last month when we received from the appropriations committees uh, and with the advice of GAO the authorization for release, the first release of funds from the Information Technology Investment Account. Now, this is a first installment towards the development of a new set of computer systems uh, and a significant step forward in our overall modernization plan. Now, that's technology. I've also testified uh, before your committee and other committees that the whole approach that the IRS takes to collection is not at the level of best business practices employed widely today in the, in the private sector and especially the financial sector. And this process, uh, which I've now had uh, put in chart form, uh, Mr. Chairman, and is shown over there on, to your left where it says collections, current state process and issues, uh, is, as you can see, I don't expect you to see all the detailed boxes there, but we can provide for your uh, illumination uh, copies of this to look at detail. But it, it basically shows the, the, the process that exists today. And, and this process is deeply embedded in a whole variety of laws, regulations, operational procedures, as well as, in particular, technology. And the, the difficult thing here is that these factors together are very tightly coupled. Uh, I wish it weren't that way, but it is the case. And that being the case, there is no way really to make major improvements without addressing all of these factors together. And what that tells you is that there is no quick or easy solution. But I think we do know what the solution is. In fact, I think it's really quite clear, and that's what we call our modernization program, which includes a totally revamped approach to collections. And the whole idea here is that to the extent possible, we will prevent taxpayer problems from occurring in the first place through education, outreach, and intervention uh, with specific taxpayer groups, such as small business owners and new business startups. And where problems occur or may occur, we will begin to be able to address these compliance problems, uh, such as repeated lack of payment of payroll taxes in the most effective way. Uh, and when we do identify a potential problem uh, or the risk of non-payment, we can use a variety of techniques to settle that debt. So that's the direction. But in order to achieve that, we must have new technology which provides an update and accurate history of all taxpayers, individuals, or businesses who are responsible for debt. I think as your committee has, has looked at this issue, you're well aware that any effective collection process, no matter who executes it, no matter what the sector is, depends on knowing accurately and on a current basis who owes the money, how much is owed, and what is the payment history. Those are fundamental, and fun unfortunately, we are deficient in all of those. So in addition to that, of course, there are other important pieces of technology which could be useful, uh, such as uh, updated decision models, telephone, predictive dialing equipment, and various kinds of collection support systems, and we don't have any of those either at the present time. Uh, moreover, I think your hearing has highlighted an important point, that, which is that for the particular type of taxes and the taxpayer population that is, was addressed in today's hearing, collection is not a one-time event. It's not a set of debts you hand it over and you collect it. 
Uh, it's an ongoing process, and this requires a carefully constructed and ongoing monitoring process, which uh, allows you to intervene at the uh, right time and to take the appropriate action based on what you know. And again, this is what we don't have. So uh, I just want to note, uh, Mr. Chairman, that in another report, GAO report, that was released uh, not too long ago on the first anniversary of uh, the Restructuring Reform Act, GAO stated, and I quote, we agree with the Commissioner that various components of IRS modernization must be implemented in an integrated fashion. Simply restructuring the organization, for example, without concurrent revisions to work processes and related information systems will do little to improve the quality of service being provided to taxpayers. So I think we're in agreement with GAO on the nature of the problem and the, is particularly relevant to the challenges that are uh, outlined today. So in conclusion, uh, I would commend GAO for its thoughtful and considered examination. We fully comprehend the significance of approximately $49 billion in payroll taxes uh, owed the federal government, and we will use the GAO report to make what near-term efforts we can to correct the deficiencies, especially within the trust fund recovery system. Um, we believe, however, that in the long run, the best and, in fact, the only solution to these fundamental problems uh, is through the massive change program that we already have underway. It will take years and it will take some significant and assured resources to complete the underlying, to solve the underlying problems in both technology and organization that uh, cause these uh, unpaid tax assessments to occur. However, with the continued support of the Congress and understanding of the time and resources involved, uh, I believe we can succeed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Let me ask you a few questions that specifically relate to your statement. I'm delighted you feel good about the computers that have been authorized and the money appropriated in Mr. Colby's budget, I assume. Uh, was that uh, all you wanted, or were you in on that budget cycle? Maybe you got a little after they'd started firming up downtown. Well, you've got to keep Two, two, two different things right. here. There has been $500 million that was previously appropriated for the Information Technology Investment Account, which was held aside specifically for technology until we could get adequate plans together. And the point I made in my testimony is that we recently got the first $35 million allotment out of that fund. And I think that really was an important step. It's, it's, it's really literally just the first step, but it indicated as was that you know, we'd made progress in defining our plans and getting a management process in place. The ongoing budget issue is still being debated, as you know, uh, in the appropriations committees. And, uh, you know, there, there, there's certainly, from my point of view, it's very, very important that we get at least what's in the President's request in order to be able to continue progress. So those are two, two separate issues. Do you know there. offhand what the President's request was for you on this? Well, the President's request in the total appropriation for all of the IRS was $8.1 billion for fiscal 2000. It did not specifically include any additional money for the information technology investment account because there was already this $500 million that had been advance funded, and uh, given our timing, it was not required to have an additional increment funded in specifically 2000. It will be very important to get that increment beginning to be resumed funding in, in the following fiscal year. Well, and you should be involved, I guess, around now for the President's budget that he proposes to Congress in January 2000. So, well, yes, that's the 2000, fiscal 2001. We're already working hard on that. Right. Okay. What do you think you, you will need that you didn't get this year? Well, I don't, I'm not prepared to talk about yeah. specific numbers for 2001, but I think the important point was that the information technology investment account, that particular segment, was advance funded in prior fiscal years. There was no funding in fiscal 2000, which was appropriate because we were not, timing-wise, we weren't, we weren't in a situation where we needed it, but, but we will need it again in 2001, so that will have right. to be resumed. Well, I'm assuming you will put in a full request on that. Yes. Uh, you know and we know OMB plays all sorts of games. Uh, if they know we're going to add the money back, they cut the budget. Good example, they've slashed away at the space program, they've slashed away at the veterans. They all know we're going to add the money back. And uh, they can look like a group of economizers. So uh, hopefully they will take yours seriously because uh, on you depend the revenue of the government and uh, they ought to be uh, up upgrading what you confronted. Uh, how do you know in IRS when a person has begun a business? Well, what do you use as your sources? There's thousands of businesses every day that the, are created. The main thing that we get is they apply for an, a number. 
they apply for an employee identification number. Um, How do they know? See, the average citizen or one that's a new immigrant has an idea, might work out of the house, et cetera. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, if they want to establish an entity, they have to apply for, for an employment identification number. If they just want to work out of their house as, a, as an individual, you know, and be a self-employed individual. Well, it's a business. In this day and age, you've got computers, as we know. Yeah. You don't have to do anything if you're, a, um, if you're a, uh, an individual and you're just working yourself as a self-employed individual. But if you want to have employees and, and pay payroll taxes, you have to have an EIN. But, of course, herein lies the issue. There are people. I can give you examples of people from my own previous business when I was in the software business where a programmer would leave the company because they had you know, a lot of talent in programming software. So I can go out and be an independent consultant and make more money and be more successful. So they would do that. And then first thing you know, they'd get together with some other people and they'd have some employees. The furthest thing from their minds was payroll taxes. I mean, most of those folks, frankly, had never, never seen uh, you know, a tax form other than maybe their own personal income tax return. And they could be easily somebody that could get behind a quarter or two before we'd ever even find out about it. And they'd get in serious trouble. Um, what, one of the key strategies that I think we need to follow for this segment of the population is to work in cooperation with, for example, state agencies and other places to uh, educate these folks. We, we have education programs now, but, but you know, more specific intervention uh, at a very early stage when through whatever source, either when they apply for a number or when we find out through some other means that they're starting a business, to just let them know, look, this is what, what you need to do to make sure you're, you're, you're complying properly with the law. We have some programs like that now, but it's a very, very small percentage of our operation. Uh, we have some initial steps that we're taking over the next fiscal year, again, modest, to try to what we call mentor new employees. It's really very simple. New employers, really very simple. It's just telling them, look, here are the forms you need to file, and here's what you need to do to make sure you stay compliant. But that is probably the cheapest thing that we could ever do to get problems solved before they occur. And that will be a major part of our emphasis of our new program, beginning with some small steps next fiscal year. Because a lot of that can be done with the local municipality. Uh, people do know, gee, I guess I better go down and get a permit for this or that. And it seems to me there's one place to educate people. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, let me ask you on the, you heard my comments on the private collector versus your own revenue officers. Uh, are you uh, going to get into an experiment on what can be done in the private sector? Well, you know, I think that here is here the issue becomes what what's the what's the first step and what's the priority step. I think there's obviously potential to do those experiments over time, but I think if you look at that chart over there and you mentioned, well, you know, the last experiment they gave old debt that wasn't realistic, but the difficulty was if you look over there on the right. Uh, that's the place that our collectors. The far I know you can't see too much of it, but we'll give you the the far right third of that chart is basically the time when our actual collectors, our, our field collectors, get the money. You get, you get the get the debt that's turned over to them. Well, by the time it's there, it's typically a couple of years old. So when they did the experiment, you know, actually, I don't honestly think there was an attempt to rig it. It was just all they did was they took what the collectors get and they gave the same thing to the private collectors. The private collectors said, what's this? This is junk. We can't collect this. And I said, yeah, but that's exactly exactly what, what many of our collectors are actually collecting on. So to really do a proper experiment, do things realistically, you really have to get a, a much earlier intervention into this cycle. If you look, if you look at the, the middle chart there, this is a chart that uh, one of our uh, analysts that's working on our new computer systems put together. And what it shows is from some private sector sources, the probability in the private sector of collecting debt, those are the green bars as, as age goes by. And it goes down to about, uh, you know, if you can see that, 12 and a half percent yeah, in 24 months. It. Well, if you look down at the bottom, that's about the time that we actually turn the debt over to our revenue officers. So, I mean, the game is almost over by the time they get, the, they, they get it. Presumably you're going to change that. Well, we're going to change it, but if you look at those boxes on the left, what you can see is there's an awful lot of boxes. Uh, and they go through a series of steps. That is not something that I or anyone else can decree is changed very, very quickly when you recognize that some of those boxes are, for example, written into law. I mean, for example, the due process, the Revenue uh, Restructuring Reform Act just added a whole lot of new boxes with some of the procedures. Some of them are, are derived just by procedures, and all of them are embedded deeply in the computer systems that we have. So this is why, you know, I've said, and the GIO, I think, agreed, there is no 
would be good if you could pick out one piece of this and just say, let's fix that. People have tried that before, and it's failed every time. I honestly think it would fail again. You really have to re-engineer this process, which includes all, all phases of it, to really make it effective. Well, uh, the key is to do it earlier, the first Absolutely. six months. Because well, you otherwise, can see those they green bars. A, the green they, bars show yeah, you. Yeah, they think it's a grant. It's like students. If they've got a loan and nobody says, hey, I want my interest, uh, they're going to say, gee, I guess somebody just turned it into a grant. I didn't hear from them. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is that as your hearing pointed out in this, and the GAO report pointed out in this particular sector, the payroll taxes, people are paying all the time. So, I mean, it isn't a matter of just a one-time debt. It's an ongoing monitoring process. And when the, in, with the right kind of computer systems, the private sector does this all the time in the credit card business. That's an ongoing process as well. It's, it's really quite feasible to monitor with statistical models to try to figure out very quickly where the risk is and figure out what, I mean, if somebody is late one or two times, that may, they may not be a risk. They may be away on vacation and they just didn't pay their bill. On another case, if you have the right information, either you could find out very quickly there's a risk. We don't have anything like that kind of information available at the IRS. Well, is there a way to uh, really get at that? Well, I think there is, and that's what we have this. I think that the whole, what we call our modernization program, basically comprises three elements. It implies reorganizing so we have you know, instead of 43 different people collecting, you know, we have a central process to oversee this. That's management. The second one is technology, which is what we're working on through the ITIA account. And the third, then, that enables you to re-engineer this to basically do what's on those green bars there. So, I mean, it, it's, the, the thing about this is it's really not hard to know what to do. We know what to do. Getting it done in, in this magnitude of what we're dealing with and in the, in the, in the, with the constraints we have is, is not so easy. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Mr. Rosati, you, you heard my discussion earlier about the possibility of a bond requirement for pay, payment of payroll taxes. And I assume if you had one, we'd have to maybe apply it only to employers that have a certain number of employees or greater, or a certain size payroll or greater. So every mom and pop wouldn't be having to file a post a bond, but do you think there's any uh, wisdom in considering a bond requirement? Well, the, 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 there certainly would be wisdom from the point of view of reducing the risk of non-payment at peril taxes. I don't think there's any question. The difficulty you get in, as the GAO representative noted, is that it does place an additional burden on the taxpayer. And really, if you look at our whole mission at the IRS, it's 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 balancing multiple objectives because on the one hand we want to make sure that we achieve compliance and we don't have people uh, failing to pay what to do. At the same time, we want to make that process as easy as possible. You know, I go to another hearing uh, once a year or so with Senator Bond's Small Business Committee, and uh, th their perspective is how can we make it easier for small businesses to start up, which is a very appropriate thing to do. So we try to accomplish both. I, I think a bonds program would have the the have to be very carefully considered in terms of what its potential uh, burden on new businesses that were starting up might be. That would be the principal downside. And payroll taxes uh, appears, if I have my data correct, to be a fairly sizable portion of your uncollected taxes, about a quarter. Yeah. To put this in taxes. perspective, though. To put this in perspective, I, 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 don't, I don't want to minimize the importance of this number, the $49 billion and the $38 billion that represents, but payroll taxes and withholding taxes are the largest share of the cash that comes into the federal government. I mean, it's a very large amount. I mean, our total in fiscal 98, our total receipts from payroll taxes, and this is both employer and employee shares, was about $550 billion. And if you, th if you add in withholding, uh, payments uh, for withheld uh, income taxes, you're getting uh, around a trillion dollars. So, I mean, this is the largest single source of money coming into the federal government. It's, a, it's an enormous sum, and it's actually a tribute to the taxpayers of America that most of this actually comes in quite smoothly, uh, and, and, and it's more the exception that causes the, the difficulty. On the other hand, the exceptions, because of the size of the system, are still very large, so I don't want to minimize them. But um, in terms of total scale of operations, there is a, around a trillion dollars a year coming in from both withheld payroll taxes and withhold income, withheld income taxes and payroll taxes. Uh, the reason that it shows up as a significant workload for revenue officers is because of the ongoing nature of this. I mean, the basic kind of 
uh, you know, you really have two kinds of tax issues, tax collection issues. One is from assessments, which are made when, for example, we audit someone and find that they underreported their taxes and uh, they owe X amount more, and then we have to go collect that money from an individual. That's a more of a sporadic event. I mean, most people don't underreport every year. The payroll taxes and the withholding is something that's in, for an in-business taxpayer is an ongoing weekly kind of an operation. So clearly, the, the the techniques of collecting and the and the intensity of the need to collect is different. When will you be able to implement the uh, l continuous levy that you were authorized to do in the uh, Taxpayer Relief Act of '97? Yeah. Well, I think, the, again, this is a program that involves primarily the Financial Management Service and the IRS together, although the, our role is mainly to provide information to them. The current target, I believe, is to have it done, uh, to be implemented in July or, let's say, the summer, a year from, about a year from now in, in, uh, in, two, in the year 2000. On that chart over there on the right, it shows you actually the a simplified version of the process that goes through. And again, I know you can't read these, but you can get the impression, and we'll be glad to give you the detailed chart. But it shows you the various steps that have to be done. I mean, it, it's definitely a good program, the 15 percent levy, because it will be able to uh, assess, you know, benefits of people, federal benefits for people. But it is not a simple thing to do uh, because, of, as you can see in these charts, there are a number of steps. For example, because of the Re uh, Restructuring Reform Act, there's a what's called a due process and collections process. So before anybody can be levied, there's an entire process that goes all the way through multiple steps internally within the IRS and potentially the tax court before you can actually assess a levy. Um, and before you can give somebody a due process and collection notice, you have to know that there's a valid levy source. So part of the boxes going back and forth there are first we have to find out that there's a tax debt, then we have to find out if the, if the financial management service actually has for example, some, some sources of levy, such as a social security payment or vendor payment, then if there is, we have to send, go through the whole due process and collection law, which is a multi-step process in and of itself. And then when that, once that's done, it has to go back to the financial management service. So I think, you know, that when the GAO representatives said they, they believe this is a good program, but there's cautionary notes, I think this is some of the things that they were saying. I, this is not to undermine or in any way uh, I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying this is not a good program. I believe that it makes a lot of sense to do this. It's just to try to provide a little, a little bit of uh, information about what's, what's involved. Um, as, as best as I know it today, and it does depend in part uh, heavily on what the Financial Management Service does, it should go into effect for everything, ex well, for most of the things that are authorized except for wages of, of federal employees. This is some complications there. But it should go into effect, uh, for example, for vendor payments and Social Security payments next July or so. And I'd finally like to get your opinion on the issue of the statute of limitations that I raised with the GOA. Do you think the law should be as it is, giving the taxpayer the option to waive the statute well, of limitations? Th th let me just say that um, that, 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 that the situation is, is evolved a little bit since the GAO, the GAO did the work that they did in conjunction with their, with their audit of the 98 financial statements. But during uh, the, approximately the latter part of fiscal 98, we actually at the IRS, as part of some of our reviews that we were conducting, you know, basically discovered or realized that this pro program was not being implemented properly. And, and, and really, the way it arose was that revenue officers or others that were collecting, what, what they were really doing was that they were uh, going into installment agreements in a lot of cases for the authorized period, 10 years. And then what was happening is, a, let's say, a few months before the statute expired, we had a computer system that was bumping these things out. And they were going back to the taxpayer and requiring them at that time, in most cases, to actually extend the statute of limitations, the alternative being potentially other, other action, other enforcement action, such as a seizure of assets or a levy of assets. So they were, they were basically, in most cases, requiring the taxpayer to extend these agreements. And we found cases where people were on agreements for as long as, frankly, 30 or 40 years, which is uh, somewhat dubious for, from a lot of points of view. And furthermore, what we also found is that that practice, although it was well-intentioned, actually violated a prior statute on a taxpayer bill of rights, which forbid us from, from basically requiring a taxpayer uh, under threat of enforcement action to extend a, um, 
a statute. So at that point, which was approximately a year ago this summer, we, we completely revised a lot of these procedures and, and, for, and, and basically don't allow installment agreements any longer, which don't pay off the full the full loan during the statute, or I think it's a five five year it's extension, one time five year one, one time five year extension. You see, we can request we can request the taxpayer to make an extension if we do it up front at the time, as you indicated, at the time that we make the installment agreement. So under our current process, what it boils down to is if you can pay off the entire loan with one extension of the statute, we we can then enter an installment agreement on that basis. The alternative is to have a, an expanded offering compromise program, which is the second leg of the stool, the second change that we've made. And as of January of this year, we did issue new guidance on the uh, offering compromise program, which allowed us to have a much wider range of different kinds of offers, including deferred payment offers, which is essentially a combination of an installment agreement and an offering compromise. So we are, and basically, if you could look at it this way, we're also we're in the process of basically re revamping and reconsidering all of these tools, so that we have uh, a. I mean, we have to conform to the Bill of Rights, uh, taxpayer Bill of Rights issues. We have to conform to the statute of limitation issues, and we have to have to try to figure out what is the best tool to collect the most money from the taxpayer. And this is part of this major revamping process that we're in. I think, in terms of the statute of limitations, we actually have the authority now. Um, essentially to work with the taxpayer to uh, request a uh, extension of the statute in order to uh, achieve a full payout uh, through an installment agreement. And if they don't accept that at the beginning, we do have a number of tools to work to, you know, that, to, to essentially provide some enforcement authority uh, that, that uh, I think gives an incentive for the taxpayer to work with us to extend that statute. So you don't think it would be helpful at all if the statute of limitation ran from the date of the last payment a taxpayer made rather than from the date of the initial tax obligation? Well, that's a technical question. I, I think what we'd like to do is to get back to you on that. I, I think that, that particular question, I don't think we can adequately think it through here online. I heard it. That's fine. And I, and I would urge you to look at state laws regarding uh, collection of private debts. Right. Uh, I know in my own state, statute of limitation um, runs from the date of the last payment on a debt. Uh, oftentimes, debtors uh, refuse to, to make a payment because they know the limitation period's running, and if they make a payment, they're going to extend the statute. Yeah, but the, uh, the, 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 There are those intricate byplays that, that you get into with these statutes. Um, but I, I think we will be glad to take take a look at that particular issue that you raised and, and, and uh, get back to you with some thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Biggert, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Eight Chairman. Eight minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Rosati, uh, the, the GAO report noted that about 70 percent of the, the amount owed in delinquent taxes predates 1994. Uh, how long on the average does it take for the IRS to go knocking on somebody's door uh, after they first default to require uh, payroll tax deposit? I, I can see well, the chart. It's 24 see, months where it's Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, there's, there's a, th what happens is, as you can see, basically see in this chart here, but we'll get, is that the first process is a notice process, normally is a, is a notice process where they, where they get some notices, uh, depending on whether it's business taxes or individual taxes. But how long does it take for that notice to go out on well, the, the average? Fir the first notice will go out, uh, may maybe I can get my colleague here to, to help me on, on this precise timing. Basically, uh, on a uh, trust fund, uh, which is a little bit accelerated over an individual, you know, like a 1040 liability, normally it's about three months from the time the return is filed to the time someone knocks on the door. In the intervening time, you've received a couple of notices and uh, hopefully had a call from the telephone, from an automated telephone system. Uh, but it would bypass a lot of the normal processing, and normally it would be about three to four months from the time the return was filed until the time someone would be out look, talking to the business. Yeah, I, I should note, though, that the return is filed you know, after the end of the quarter. So you've got a whole quarter of deposits, and then you've got the leg time till the return is filed, and then you've got um, potentially up to four months, uh, you know, before someone. And that, that, that's probably the most accelerated process we have. That's, that's a whole lot faster than most of the processes. So that's really, uh, could be then seven months. 
Well, from the time of the deposit, you know, depending on, you know, a deposit goes weekly or, you know, biweekly. Do you have any statistics then about how many companies have already gone out of business before they receive the first notice, if it's seven months? No, I, I, we really don't have. I can probably, we can probably look to see if we can do an extract on that, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if we would have that data available anywhere. Okay. Get the uh, phone, uh, microphone a little closer to you, Mr. Sure. Peters. Thank you. I'm just trying to figure out how many businesses um, are notified and they've already gone out of business because it seems like the process takes such a long time. It, well, we don't have the exact numbers, but without having any numbers, we already know it takes too long. I mean, our whole process is to re-engineer this. We do have this alert system, as GAO has noted, that tries to get some intervention earlier, but it has its, has its limitations. With I mean, your revamping of the, the computers and, and your program, will there be something done with the first alert? I, also, GAO noted that the, that it didn't seem like the first alert was working. Is there? Right. Do you have something well, to and, change and that? Yes, I, I think that that again, this is where you get into this intricate combination of regulations, organization, technology, and so forth. Um, I mean, w part of the problem is that you know to, that, that that what triggers the alerts now is a very crude kind of a process. I mean, it requires I think four four quarters of delinquent taxes, you know, which is a pretty stringent criteria. And the other, so, you know, and then we have a limited number of revenue officers that, that can do this, so sometimes the alerts don't always get followed up on. I mean, the, the goal where we need to go on this is to have much better history and much better records and then use these, what the private sector uses in the credit card business are risk prediction models. They take all the things in the computer into account, including uh, past payment histories, delinquencies, you know, the patterns of payments and, and all these things. I mean, you've probably made a credit card charge at some time, uh, most people have, where they uh, intervened right on the spot when you were making the charge and called you back to, to verify that it was really you that was making the charge because their models have detected that particular payment even. So I mean, that's how sophisticated it can be in the private sector. There's nothing about our process that says we couldn't take advantage of that kind of technology if we had the technology. And the effect of it would be that we would know in a much more precise way where the real risks are and where we need to intervene and when, and we could take the appropriate action. The appropriate action might be do nothing because this is the taxpayer that, you know, based on history is really going to pay and it's just a, probably a clerical error or something. Don't, don't waste your resources on it to, look, this is a, a real risk, high risk, and you need to send a revenue officer out there right away and, and sit down with that taxpayer and figure out what to do. Or it could be an intermediate ground, like just sending a notice or sending a, uh, uh, sending a, uh, a phone call. So the, that's, I mean, it's really not hard to figure out what we should be doing, and it's very, very well modeled in the private sector. But it, again, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. It really depends on having the right technology, the right information, and also the right management structure so that when you get the information, you know, you can, you, can send the in, you can send it to the right people and have them act on it. Now, right today, it's, 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 it, the alert system is a very crude, very, very crude attempt to approximate that kind of approach. And, and as GAO indicated, being crude, it doesn't, it doesn't work that well. And they also mentioned that there were certain types of businesses, like the construction business or the restaurant business, that are, are more prone to fall in the category of defaulting. Sure. So this would be an area then that uh, would be targeted in, for the type of business well, that you might. Send hopefully, in more IRS precisely rate. than that, because not all re that could be a factor that would be taken mm -hmm. into account. But I mean, basically, what you want to know is where's your risk. And you want to know that very quickly so that you can do something about it. I mean, well, are there, then are there any initiatives that the IRS has taken um, to target high-risk industries, or you intend to be more I precise? Think, than uh, that? Honestly, at this point, um, you know, that 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 we really don't have a, a fine-grained enough information to to do that without potentially, you know, you have to be very careful in the IRS when you start quote targeting anybody um, because they. People on the whole don't like to be targeted unless you can prove there's a very, very good reason to it. And just identifying a whole industry is, 
is not so wise. But uh, but I think what we need to do is is to I mean is to I keep sounding like a broken record, but to have more accurate and up to date information, where we can apply real models that would then be rigorous that would allow us to to intervene quickly. In the meantime, um, I think you know we, we we are stuck with some basically modest refinements. Now the one thing that we the one key thing, and you might want to mention the mentoring okay. program. We have one initiative that we've improved approved right now that I think gets partly to Mr. Horn's point about the new employers, and I'd ask Mr. Peterson to describe this, because this is one thing that we can do now. We're, we, we actually started a test that's, uh, that's going on this week, and it's a program we're talking about that, uh, that's called Mentor and Monitor. And what we're doing is with every, uh, in a certain area, we're actually testing this out of the North Texas district, but uh, with every business that applies for an employer identification number in that area, we're going, we're making contact with every one of those and explaining what their requirements are. Uh, explaining to them what they need to do to be sure that they're filing all their federal taxes, including payroll taxes. Uh, we then go ahead and monitor their track record and make sure how they're doing and if there's any kind of uh, miss of a payment or anything else, we give them a call right at the, on the spot. And if they have significant, significant problems, we'll send a revenue officer out. So, and we're doing that against a test group to try and get a, uh, uh, an analysis of what that kind of attention does in terms of uh, the general business versus the uh, the ones that get the extra attention and see if that isn't a very valid uh, way of starting to do a little bit of what we're talking about in terms of more outreach uh, and more monitoring to make sure that uh, that people are aware of their tax responsibilities as well as being as well as complying with them is there anything to with the states when uh, a company files for articles of incorporation that there would be information is there information given with that incorporation or would the states perhaps uh, include not that in there? Not in the mentor and monitor program. I mean, there are things that we've done, but it's the difficulty with that is, is uh, uh, those kinds of agreements are done state by state under the Fed state agreements. Um, a lot of states that, uh, that have no tax have real, no real interest in entering into a Fed state agreement with us at this time because there's nothing, you know, there's no quid pro quo of, change, of, uh, of exchanging information. Uh, so it really is a state-by-state -state basis right now. We've got a program, you know, obviously a formal program that attempts to do that, um, but it really, uh, our success with those kinds of agreements really do run uh, uh, by the individual state and their, and their wish to get involved with that. I, uh, we are trying to do something in the collection area this fall in terms of uh, first time we're doing a uh, uh, nationwide uh, Fed State Symposium on some of the things we can do to try and uh, share those kinds of ideas and do things together. But that's a, that's a first-time effort as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, on that uh, last point, it seems to me if you picked a city, you could pick mine if you want, uh, Long Beach or the state, California, you can get those uh, incorporations and those business licenses. They're glad to render it for a fee. And that might be one way to check when businesses are coming in and going out. So it just seems to me there's a way to collect $49 billion if we put our minds to it. And I guess I'd ask you, Commissioner, uh, what in particular are you going to do in response to the GAO report? I know you feel they're right yeah. on it. Well, I mean, as, as we indicated in my testimony, there, there are some specific individual initiatives that we could take, particularly with respect to the trust fund recovery penalty. Uh, we have some initiatives to try to clean up what are called the transcripts. Um, and uh, the initiation of these trust fund recovery penalties, although I don't want to overstate the effect of that because this is one of the most extreme examples of the, as GEO has noted, of the deficiencies of the computer systems where we have two tape files, you know, one in individual taxpayers and one in business taxpayers, and the process of managing this trust fund recovery is very, very labor intensive and very error prone, but we do have to do some things to try to improve the cleanup of that, and, we, and that's probably one of the most important things. We do have a, a few specific initiatives on the payroll issue. Probably one of the more important is this pilot project on the early early intervention with the mentor, mentoring, uh, monitoring and mentoring. But in all honesty, the, the degree of impact that we can have on improving this uh, by these kinds of steps is relatively limited. I, I really have to say that very honestly. It's relatively limited. The, 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 the sources of this problem are very fundamental, and they go to the things that we were talking about. Um, and, I, and, and I think uh, 
it would be wrong to, to tell this committee that there's anything that we can do that's going to have a big impact on this area short of what we really need to do, which is a very, very fundamental modernization and revamping of our whole collections process and, and especially the technology. Um, we also have the issue that I think was raised by GAO of the more recent decline in statistics. I mean, underlying all of this, we also have a major improvement on taxpayer rights that we're trying to implement that was called for by the Restructuring Reform Act. And we haven't talked about that here, but I, and I don't want to imply that I don't support that because I think it's the right thing to do to have these taxpayer rights. But the immediate impact of this, short of having also improved our, tech, our, our, our technology, is simply to elongate the process. I mean, it goes in the exact opposite direction in some ways. Not that it can't be compensated for in the long run, but in the near term, what it does is add more boxes onto this chart and uh, more labor-intensive processes, and they have to be done manually, which in turn reduces the number of collection uh, activities that our number of cases that our officers can work. So um, this is another aspect of what we're dealing with. The, the net effect of this is that I think that there are some immediate steps that we can take, particularly in the trust fund area, that can have some, some effect, ameliorative, uh, the mentoring and monitoring program. These are steps, uh, and, and clearly we will do those and monitor them, but it would be misleading everyone to believe that this problem can be solved in any short-term way by anything we do short of really revamping this whole process. Uh, let me throw out a suggestion for you to think about. You've got about 102,000 employees, as I remember, unless there's been some changes. Suppose you gave them a little crib sheet and a phone number, and they phoned up some of these people, each one of them, to be in touch with real people. Some of them aren't in touch with real people. A lot of them are but uh, you'd make it an agency effort. It's like libraries that uh, sort of have Good Samaritan Day, bring the books back yeah. kind of thing. Well, but yeah, what about using those 102,000 people well, to make one call a week? The trouble is all those 102,000 people are doing something, and um, most of them, you know, th there's... In order to even contact the taxpayer and the IRS, there's, there's many requirements, okay, that are legally imposed. Um, you know, without the proper training, I'd be a little reluctant to, to have people calling, calling taxpayers, also without having necessarily the correct information. Um, so uh, I think that, that might be a hard one to, um, to, to implement in our current... Well, think about it. Okay. it, it it's yeah. like uh, yeah. having a campus blood yeah. drive or something. Right. You get right. their juices going and see if they can win okay. and, uh, you know, give flowers to the ones that win. <laughs> Uh, on you heard the discussion on computer capability and interoperability right. between agencies. What do you think of trying to get the benefits straight from other agencies? Uh, well, I wasn't quite clear as to whether the I did hear the question, but I wasn't quite clear as to whether the idea was that, for example, when another agency was making a loan to an individual, that they, they would, would first check, check see with if the, the taxes were paid. Yeah, and they would check with the and IRS rather than the taxpayer. Yeah. Was that the idea? Well, they could ask the taxpayer, but there ought to be a way that they check the IRS. Yeah, there is a way to do that, um, and, and private mortgage companies can do that, too. Um, and it requires the, the approval of the taxpayer, but if they're requesting a loan, you know, that could be a requirement. for. And they can request a transcript from the IRS of their taxes. Um, so that is a, an ongoing process. Uh, let me just say that this is another example, interestingly, though, that the current process for doing that, and it's exactly for that purpose, I mean, it, it, it serves that purpose. If you're applying for a loan, you sign a waiver, you send in a request to the IRS, we send, we do a transcript of your, it's called a transcript, it just basically says, here's, here's the situation, whether you've paid your taxes, and send it to the lender. So that serves that purpose. The real problem is right now that's a very manual, intensive process. It takes about six to eight weeks uh, to do that. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, proposal that we're working on to, to, to do a more automated version uh, through an email kind of a process that would speed that up dramatically. Uh, the principal issue there is is uh, various security and privacy issues because here we run into some security and privacy concerns that if there's you know risk of unauthorized people getting access to taxpayer records that could be a problem. So there is a process right now to do it, um, and it could be implemented. It's just a little labor-intensive and a little time-consuming, but with some additional investment, um, we, we could automate that process. 
one of the concerns we've had before is when various excise taxes come into the Internal Revenue Service, there's a coupon on them. But there's apparently not a coupon that says this is Medicare deduction, this is Social Security deduction, right. and all the other deductions one has. Yeah. Uh, and instead of that, we just dump it all in one big pile, mm -hmm. and you've got uh, an office of what analysis that, uh, mm -hmm. and Social Security has it, that they say, well, this percentage is ours, you owe us for our account. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, there isn't a real trust account there. Now, we've tried to lock that off so presidents can't put their fingers on it and spread it around on all sorts of Santa Claus programs. Instead, we want to preserve Social Security. So we've put a 100% radioactive fence right around that so-called trust fund. Now, do we have a trust fund or don't we? And why can't we get them to put the coupon on and actually add those up with yeah. all that new high-powered yeah. computer machinery well, you have? Th there's two parts to this. One is what we would have to do internally. Well, first off, let, let me just say that y you are correct in that the tax deposits that are made on a weekly basis or depending on taxpayer how frequently uh, are just that. They're a deposit. They're not a tax return. And traditionally, they have only designated very limited information, so they don't uh, precisely say what tax trust fund each tax should go for, excise taxes or Social Security taxes. This then requires a reconciliation process, which is what you've described. I think that, you know, it certainly would be feasible to require uh, precise designations uh, at the time of deposit rather than at the time of return. That would be possible. But there are two issues that have been, uh, I think, repeatedly stood in the way of this. The, the more s one issue is just internal. We don't have the computer systems, again, to process this data right now. And, well, know, on it, that very point, yeah. uh, you were familiar with a universal price system in your friendly grocery store. Right. And they can just do a sweep like all of those coupons, and you'd have an accurate statement of yeah. what should go where. Well. We, we have the we have this we actually do scan the coupons. In fact, most of it comes in electronically now through banks. But it doesn't but, have you subdivided into well, Medicare but, but and see, Social Security. True, and that's why the, the I said the easier problem to solve is the systems problem that could be solved. The the more difficult question is really a policy question that I think you know possibly would require some consultation broadly throughout Congress because it would require putting an additional mandate on taxpayers. It would require taxpayers who currently can file a relatively simple, just here's the total dollars, and then just file a return once a quarter. You're putting it on taxpayers, in quote. You're putting it on the employer to deduct it, one of the greatest schemes ever known to mankind. Well, Beardsley Rummel in the Second World War. Take it out before you give them the money. Well, it's true. We're trying I mean, to get money be the back employers. to citizens, and we're having a terrible time. A lot but, of people up here don't agree with that. Well, I, I'm simply saying that it, what it would require, and I'm not debating the merits of it, what it would require it would be telling employers, um, uh, businesses, and many of them are, you know, at least a fraction of them, a significant fraction of them are small businesses, and that whereas today they can file a relatively simpler thing, which just says, here's how many dollars we're depositing. It would require them to enumerate, uh, you know, obviously it would require them to enumerate how much was for each purpose. Uh, th they don't always respond uh, with great enthusiasm uh, to that proposal. Uh, and it, and it, they can do it now voluntarily through the electronic system. Um, but I think to make it complete, to provide accurate information, it would have to be mandated. And that would be the policy issue. Do we want to mandate, you know, uh, a couple million uh, businesses to put that de more detailed information at the time they make these deposits. Um, and I don't really think it's a decision that the IRS sh should make, actually. I think that's a policy issue that ought to be determined. Uh, well, some somewhere process. in the law, it must say you're supposed to give us, uh, in the case of IRS, you're supposed to give half that uh, salary to a, per a certain level and match it yes. with the employer's share. It's the employer's share, the employee's share. Now, they give you very complicated payment statements. Practically everybody has that. I don't know why everybody can't, if everybody's doing it, why can't the IRS do it and get them to put the accurate amount? Because what I'm hearing is 
that let's say somebody makes uh, $30,000 a year and uh, you've got uh, maybe uh, 5,000 goes for the employer, 5,000 for the uh, individual. And what it sounds like is they can just write you a check and it might only be 4,000 when they should have matched it to 5,000 or well, vice versa. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a question of when they do it because peop they do require quarterly, for example, on employment taxes to file a tax return that lays out what they've, what those, all those details are. The difficulty is that prior to the time that they file their tax return, they actually have to deposit the cash, usually weekly or biweekly, bi depending on, 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 on what size of employer they are, sometimes more frequently with each payroll. And, 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 and it's the reconciliation of those two things that rates the issue. So we, we do have the tax return, and they do fill out the tax return quarterly in the case of employment taxes and also the, the excise taxes. But the real issue is what to do about the deposits, okay? It's the time, the deposits is when they actually send us the cash, and, it, and the deposit is just that. As it is, as it's conceived today, it's not a tax return. It's just a deposit. It's just a, a cash advance, if you will, that says this is a cash advance we're sending you generally for this purpose, and it's not, as a tax return is, detailed as to what precisely is there. So what would have to be done to be totally precise along the lines of, 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 uh, of, 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 of I think what you're suggesting is we would have to convert the deposit instrument into something that lays this out in detail. And in our electronic deposits, we already have the capability to do that. But the question that comes up is do we mandate the taxpayers to provide us that detail at the time of deposits, which is more frequently than at the time of returns. And you know, that's a question that I don't know that it's up to the IRS to make a decision on. It's really more of a policy question. Certainly, if that was the decision of Congress, um, that that was what, what was required, you know, that th th that was what was... Uh, well, I, we look at our check and we see what's taken out of it. And uh, if they're not depositing it, it seems to me <laughs> that's where we think they're depositing it because they've deducted it off our gross payroll. And uh, where is it? Is it uh, sort of an endowment for swimming pools or what? I mean, you know, we have great curiosity. The average person that goes gets their check once a month by electronic deposit with a long list of things that have been deducted, health care, all the rest. Noble causes all. But, uh, you know, if they're going to do that, why don't they put the money in there on the other side? They've deducted it from us. Mr. Turner gentleman from Texas. Just one follow-up question. Uh, Mr. Rosati, did I, did I understand you to say that if an SBA loan officer wants to find out whether or not the individual he's loaning this SBA money to owes payroll taxes to the IRS, that he could make a call to find that out, but if he did, it would take six weeks for him to get an answer? Right. That's the way it works. Get a transcript. To get, to get a transcript of taxpayer information today, it's a very manual intensive process. You didn't just make a call. You have to send in a form, get the taxpayer's authorization. It goes through a manual process. I know this sounds startling. I, I've been in this office a year and a half. I've found many startling things. Um, uh, wh when I was down at one of the places that we do this is in Tennessee. And when I, my first trip down, I don't mean to tell a war story, but my first trip down to a ser an IRS service center, I was down in the service center in Tennessee, and I was asking about this process because I used to do business with mortgage companies that, you know, check these kinds of things, and I asked about this, and they went through this process, and, it, you know, sure enough, it takes six to eight weeks. They said, there's a, there's a car factory down the road here. They can build your car quicker, and we can give you a transcript for a taxpayer on their, on their return. And, you know, it isn't that we have bad people that are doing a lousy job. The process is extremely labor-intensive. It's it's not computerized really at all. You know, there's any number of different steps that you have to go through. And by the time you mail it and so forth and get it, it takes about six weeks. Now, we have a, a pilot project that does it electronically and through an email system that basically does it almost instantaneously. Um, and um, this is something that has been piloted or, and is very, would speed it up to almost nothing. Uh, the issues there have to do with both some technology issues, but mostly privacy issues in ensuring that there's adequate security because the other thing that we bump up into, anytime we release taxpayer data to anybody, we have very strong uh, requirements on us to ensure that A, it's only given to somebody that's authorized to receive it, that it's not misused for other purposes, that it isn't intercepted during transmission, that there is a whole variety of security requirements that have to be met. So when you start to transmit it electronically through, uh, you know, an, an email type of environment, you run into those kinds of issues. 
the real solution to this, though, I believe, is to automate this through an email process so any taxpayer that wants to uh, get a loan or wants to get their information to verify something that they need should be able to send in an authorized transaction and have it sent back right away. That's clearly the right way to go. Well, I, I hope that your modernization program will get you there so that uh, we can do that. And in the meantime, I hope that we can persuade the Small Business Administration to request um, of the IRS six weeks in advance to find out before they close a loan and disperse funds. There may be some ways that we could work with the Small Business Administration. Six weeks is the There might be some ways, frankly, if the Small Business Administration, you know, set up a process for us that we could work a special way to get it to them quicker than six weeks. Well, according to this GAO study that we heard testimony on this morning, if we could solve that one problem, we could save uh, $31.6 million in unpaid payroll taxes if somebody would just ask right. before they disperse the funds. We'd be happy, we'd be more than happy to work with the Small Business Administration on that issue. And I, we have a good relationship with them today. The administrator is someone I've gotten to know and, you know, if that was something that we, we'd be happy to work with them on that and maybe we can find some. We, we have Great. all these little sort of special solutions that we come up with to work these particular problems uh, in, in interim. It's not the right way to go long term, but we, we can do some of those things if, 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 we, if we work on it. Let me ask before we wrap this up, does the General Accounting Office have any other comments they'd like to make based on this discussion? They don't. Your lucky day. Uh, Commissioner, we assure you we want to do everything we can to help you. Uh, we're from the government too, so <laughs> we're here to help you. Yes, I have great confidence in your leadership. Thank you. And uh, hope that when we meet again, uh, you'll have that $49 billion uh, in the if nearest federal depository run by the Treasury. That would help us on a lot of things we have to do here, like dealing with Medicare, et cetera. $49 billion could sure help us right now. So uh, we uh, hope you'll find it soon. Uh, let me thank the staff uh, here that uh, helped on this, uh, Russell George, the staff director and uh, chief, chief counsel, Randy Kaplan to my left and your right, uh, the council and professional staff member, uh, Bonnie Heal, director of communications back there, Grant Newman, our clerk, Chip Allsweet, our staff assistant, and uh, Sh Sean Gallagher, the an intern for us. And then on the minority side, we have uh, Michelle Ash and Trey Henderson and Early Green and Jean Gosa, minority professional staff members. And we have our two court reporters, uh, Randy Sandifer and Cindy Sabo. And I thank you, gentlemen, for coming, and I wish you well. And uh, as you know, if we don't see you before, we'll see you on April 15th, as <laughs> usual. <laughs> but we are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
The House returns today at 12.30 Eastern Time for morning hour speeches, during which members may speak on any topics. Then at 2, they'll begin work on a number of suspension bills, and later the Foreign